Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to continue our previous two videos on assembling and finishing our Woods Runner kit. Uh, to kind of recap, the first video was on a first and second videos were on the assembly process. I think the third video focused on uh, fitting the ramrod. In this video, I'm not sure how far we will uh, get along, but we'll start sanding the stock. And it is a little noisy in the shop. We have some production going on, even though it's a Saturday. We, would, we actually, there we go. We actually run seven days a week here, so we're quite busy and it's hard to find a time that uh, there isn't at least a little bit of noise. So we'll do the best we can. This is the rifle as we had it assembled in the last video. It could be shot right now, no problem. It's all completely functional. So the next step in order to finish it up is we're gonna start the stock sanding. Sanding and scraping, we'll talk about both. So one of the first things to do when sanding a stock is to have a decent setup. It, it's nice to have a vise. You don't have to have a vise. You can probably do it on a table, but a vise is nice. And a, a light is very, very helpful, especially an articulating arm light. This one has some kind of a goofy bulb in it. It's not an incandescent bulb, but incandescent bulbs I think are better. Um, they cast a, a shadow more. And shadows are very important when uh, you know, sanding a stock. You want directional light. You don't want fill light. Fill light is bad. Fluorescent lights, LED overhead lights, or fill lights. By directional, I mean you can tailor where the light is coming from. So you can move it. And it, it'll, what it'll do, it'll reveal any kind of little defects that you have on your stock. So you want to make it look as bad as you can while you're sanding it. So in ordinary circumstances, it looks as good as it can. So you're constantly going to move the, this light in order to uh, you know, see the stock best during the sanding process. And that goes for a lot of long rifle work. Um, shaping the stock, that's very important to see shadow lines, uh, things like that. Um, also carving, it's exceedingly important to use directional cross lighting. Uh, fill lighting is not good. Some people I've seen have over, have uh, lights on their optivisors and those aren't very good either because they just move constantly wherever your head is. And that's not, you can't control the light source then. And I've seen other people that have just tiny little lights. They try to get directional cross lighting and stuff and it just they're just not too good. I found these lights to be best, just an articulating arm light. The older ones you can sometimes find on eBay or maybe at thrift stores or garage sales. Those are good, probably better than modern ones. As far as the tools to use to sand the stock or scrape the stock, just a decent woodworking sandpaper. These happen to be, Mirka is a brand that we use a lot here in the shop. You don't have to use Mirka, there's a lot of different kinds. There's Norton and just whatever, but just a decent brand of sandpaper will be fine. 150, 220, and 320 are good grits. It's good to have a block of wood that you have the sandpaper attached to. This sandpaper I use has a PSA back, an adhesive back, so you can just stick it to whatever you want and make it convenient. Sometimes I'm just using this rule here to put sandpaper on it. It works well sometimes. And then we have also this little sanding, rubber sanding thingamajigger that uh, works very well to sand the stock. Very helpful. You wrap the sandpaper around it and hold it like this. Like in places like Woodcraft or maybe Lee Valley or Rockler sell these things and they're, they're very convenient. It might be something that we want to start selling. Never did think, didn't think about that until now. Uh, a file is also something that, that uh, just a single cut mill file, this happens to be a Baco single cut mill file, it can be also be very useful in, in, in uh, prepping a stock. I don't have a scraper out, but I'll get a few scrapers out and I'll be back. Okay, so as far as scraping goes, cabinet scrapers work well, card scrapers, although I've seen other people use uh, like carpet knives, various things. I like to use card scrapers or cabinet scrapers. These are pretty thin that I like to use. This is about as thin as they, you can find. This one's probably like 15 or 20 thousandths thick. Makes it very flexible. And generally I think the, the thinner they are, the 
finer the cut they 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 kind of make or it just seems that way anyway so these are good again probably bought these from woodcraft or lee valley or somewhere like that and also little ones are good this is uh it was a little rectangular one that i reshaped you can make them out whatever shape you want there's another one here different shape so yeah so scraper, scrapers are useful as well as uh sandpaper now we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to sand or why you might want to scrape sanding is easier uh to do to get a nice finish um i recommend for most people that are just getting started to sand there's nothing wrong with sanding at all um scraping can be, be nice as well it can leave a little bit more texture to the surface um, maybe a, a surface that has a little more interest it can be a little more difficult to get a nice finish with a, a scraped surface um, but it's just just options both are good so you can make a fine rifle both ways I just read somewhere on a forum where somebody says that for a rifle to be a fine rifle it has to be scraped which is kind of nonsense so. <laughs> so you can do it both ways so we'll start sanding here and uh, then maybe move towards uh, scraping. So the first thing you'll do is you wanna make sure the wood is flush to the metal, where all the metal parts meet the wood. So for example, you'd look here to make sure that the, the wood and metal are flush with the top of the butt plate, where the tang is inlet, the sides of the butt plate, Those are the primary areas, maybe the, the uh, ramrod pipe. So we're going to hit those areas first while the parts are in place. You want to sand after the, after the whole gun is assembled and the parts are in place. Like I've seen some try to sand a stock before the gun's assembled and it's just, it's just nonsense. It's craziness. Um, and same thing goes with finishing parts. You don't want to finish your metal parts. Before the gun is assembled because the whole idea is you assemble them you probably might beat them up a little bit and you're going to finish them together you're going to sand them down together and you don't want to have to go back and repolish everything so it just it makes no sense to polish up butt plates and trigger guards before you you know, build the gun so okay i'll pull the box lid out and i'm just going to go ahead and make sure like i mentioned this sandpaper is a little dull probably put a new piece on here start out with 150 grit it just sticks on so I'm gonna make sure these areas are sanded and cut to the area where the box fits I'm gonna sand it make sure it's nice and flat any tool marks are out that's one of the big goals here is to make sure the surface is not only flat where it needs to be but eliminating tool marks and imperfections in the surface now I'm going to move up here and sand alongside the, uh, the box inlet. And you have to respect the shape of the gun. You don't just want to sand kind of randomly or wildly. If there's a corner, you want to maintain that shape. So, you know, I, I've seen people that just kind of just sand the whole stock, just like, and just don't pay attention to the shape of the gun and that doesn't usually work too good. So I'm making sure that it's flush with the, the butt plate. So I'm sanding down the butt plate and the wood at the same time. I'm going to do the same down here. And these parts fit pretty darn good, so there's usually not much difference between the wood and the butt, wood and the, the metal parts. But it's a good thing to do. So no steps or anything. You can see very well, maybe I'll stand here. Our lighting isn't too good where we're at, so I moved the light a lot. And having the camera disrupts the light too, but we'll be okay. If I get the lighting better, I can see. Like I said, I want to make sure the wood is even with the, the brass.
And you can imagine if this was already polished up and stuff, you'd just be scratching it. So don't do that. Okay, so that looks pretty good. While I'm here, I see a little bit of remnant of the machining. You can see that little step, so I'm gonna just hit that and screw it up a little bit. Another area would be the, the tang. So the tang, again, you don't want it to stick above the, the wood to stick above the, the tang surface. Now I can take the lock off and it'd be easier, but I can also use a file and just sort of file this down. I'm gonna have to come over in this direction. Just make sure these are nice and equal. Yes, they are, so that's nice. Now we'll see what else we need to do to make sure they're equal. The entry pipe is another area. You see how the wood is a little bit higher than the pipe there? You can see that shadow line probably. So we're gonna file that down or sand that down. Again, we're gonna move the light again. So now I can see, if I, if I had in a different spot, I'd be very frustrated because I couldn't see. Come on, get that pin out of the way. I'm probably gonna slide this a little further forward. Get a little work up the forearm. So you don't wanna just, when you're making anything flush, you don't wanna just file this area. You need to spread that out. So it, you're shaping the whole area, not just the little, one little spot. So we're gonna file this down. It's okay to hit the pipe a little bit, like at the moldings. You can see we're beveling off those moldings a little bit, which is no problem whatsoever. So we got a little power interruption, but we'll keep on videoing here. We'll start up our machines later, but we'll keep on videoing. It's a pain in a CNC shop when there's a power interruption because jobs are in the middle and It'll at least make it quieter in here, I guess. Making sure it's flush at the back as well. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I don't feel any step. That's looking good. Now we're gonna do the other side. So I'm gonna push this bot pin through, tap it here. So we're gonna do the same here where we're gonna make sure this is nice and even. Yeah, I never thought about that. So the pins are in at this stage, so you just move them around. Yeah, you could pull them out or you can just move them around. Either way works. Okay, so that's nice and even. So that's looking pretty good. And again, I'm just kind of blending it back. I'm not just focusing on the one area. So that looks pretty good. Now, so we had a little inter interruption there. The power flickered and something went wrong with a, a vacuum pump that we have. Um, and the motor caught on fire, so we had to put that fire out. Kind of disturbing, but whatever. So now we will take this apart, or at least mostly apart, and start sanding the stock. So some of the things get in the way when you try to sand, like the trigger guard gets in the way, the lock gets in the way. Sometimes it's nice to keep the butt plate on because it, it keeps you from rolling over the edges. So we'll keep the butt plate on. We'll probably keep the barrel in for a little while because it allows the stock to have a little more rigidity. We'll pull these pins. Easy way to take the lock out, just to unthread it and then tap on the, the bolts. 
And a, a pretty easy way to take the side plate out is just take a screw and you kind of just tip it to the side and it'll grab. Nice little trick. So I'll take some pins out. Let me get a pin punch. And again, an easy way to take the a good way to take the guard out is to hit the tail end of the guard. It's a good way. We could probably leave the trigger in, I think. So the trigger plate's another area where we can stand to make sure it's down. We can we can leave the trigger in. So we'll take a piece of again 150 grit. along the trigger plate. It's a little easier if we take the trigger out, but we can get by without. And if this isn't 100% flush, it's not the end of the world. Sometimes you'd see originals that the trigger plate is sunk a little bit below the surface. Sometimes at the tail end, they really sink below the surface because they're spiked in. So as long as it's pretty darn good, it's, it's okay. So that'll work there. Well, let's just go ahead and start sanding the stock now. We've got high winds outside, but I think everything's okay. Uh, so we're gonna sand the flat for along the lock, make sure there's tool marks out of it, make sure it looks good. Now we're gonna go back to this little sanding thing here. You can see how you wrap a piece of paper around it and kind of cinch it up tight. Now we're gonna, like I said, this light is not as good as I would hope for, but it, whatever kind of bulb it is, it's, I like this ordinary rough service in, incandescent bulbs, and this thing is some kind of like a LED bulb or something, and I honestly don't think they work near as good for being able to see what you need to see. But we'll, We'll get by here. <laughs> this shape, as you can see, works pretty darn good to get up into all the different areas. And you can buy, still buy rough service incandescent bulbs. Again, I need to move the light. Makes the filming, it makes it hard to move the light. But I move it generally much more when I'm sanding a stock. Move it as much as you need. I'll go around. And I might even change this light bulb here because it's just terrible is what it is. Definitely LED because it's cool. So yeah, some kind of new dumb thing is what it is. So I've changed the light bulb. You can see how much more orange and warm it is. It's really noticeable. And I don't know if you can see or not, but I can see the shadows of the stock much better. It's just not that white fill every, everywhere. So I'm going to keep on using, using the good old incandescent bulbs. So now we're just going through the whole thing where we're just sanding. I'm pretty much sanding with the grain, even though if there's curves, I still sand with the grain. So a good example of that is like up around the lock moldings. You know, some people are tempted to kind of sand around the lock molding like that. And your tent, what usually will happen,
Okay, back at it here. We have a tent outside for storing wood and it seems like it's ready to take off. But. So getting back to where I was, if you sand around it, you're gonna usually make a groove. You don't wanna just kind of follow the shape and go this, you don't wanna do this, what I'm doing right here. That's bad. What you wanna do is sand with the wrist and then just work up to the, the edge. And if you can't see where magnification, work up to the edge. And you don't really want to round those over too much. I mean, sometimes you might want to round them over intentionally, but it's a good practice to, to be able to sand and then round them over if you want at the end. Then you can control the degree of radius on the side of your lock panels. The sand in the stock takes some time. There's no way around it, but it's not necessarily hard work. It just takes some time to do a nice job of it. Okay. So we have the, more or less the top side of this stock done. Let's see another tool marks I missed. You're kind of on the lookout for any machine marks is what you're looking for. Now we'll work the bottom up through here. And then we'll maybe go to the top or something. So I'm going to move over to here now. If I change the light direction. I'm going approaching down to these corners but I won't round them off. I'll just work right down to the edge. And you're kind of looking to see where the sandpaper is cutting. And we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna work up to the lock panel, but still running the sanding sponge or block more or less parallel to the wrist. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I'm not really seeing any tool marks left. We can move the light in different directions to make sure we don't have any. Terrible wind outside. Gust must be, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 miles an hour. Now, next area we'll do is we'll go down to the top of the cone. You can go in about any order you want. Let's just go down to the top of the cone. If you're careful, you can usually tell when you're sanding down to a corner because the sanding kind of changes the color of the wood slightly. You can usually see as you're approaching. A corner of the shape of the stock, I guess I should say. So the lines on these stocks are pretty well established so just try to not really any real room to reshape things that much so follow the, the shape that you're given I think that looks pretty good I don't really see any kind of inconsistencies 
Again, this is 150 grit paper. So now I would work on the other side. So we're up, we've gone up through about this far on the on the uh, the lock side. Move over to the cheek side. And use this big sanding block here if we want a little bit on the top of the cheek piece. Sometimes you can use it to get right up underneath the cheek piece too. This is where sandpaper on a rule like this works well, just to get right up underneath the cheek piece. These other areas, again, I'm gonna just use the sanding block. Don't be afraid to change your sandpaper often too. Dull sandpaper takes a lot more work to use. Sandpaper's cheap, so just change it. Lose power here. It's flickering. Good thing we didn't restart the machines. Yeah. Again, I'm just trying to remove any pool marks, any tearing there in the grain there might be, although we don't get too much tearing with the machine we're using to make this woods runner. Or any little dents that might have happened during the finish of the assembly process. Again, I'm being careful not to round over the, the edges of the lock panel. Just working up to them. And you can see they're not hollowed out a lot. Rarely do you see a lock panel that's heavily hollowed out. And then some later guns, percussion guns, you might see that a little bit more. But the tendency of people that are just beginning is to try to define the lock panel more by using some kind of a round file or a half round file and really trying to cut it out. But it's really not how a gun, at least of this period, should be shaped. Okay, looking pretty good. Here as I can tell. Okay. Again, I'm looking for any inconsistencies. I know this is a little bit boring and probably doesn't show a great deal through the, the camera, but Hopefully my description will help. Also with the cross lighting, what even works better than just um, a light like this is to turn off the overhead lights as well. And you can really see shadows even more. And you can see defects even, even more if you just have 100% directional light. Now I'm gonna start working in this cheek piece area. Again, there's hardly any tearing the grain or anything like that. There's some very, very faint tool marks, but not much. This seems to work pretty well, fitting in that area. In this case, it's kind of the, where the comb meets the wrist, it's kind of an angle bit of a hollow at this angle, so I'm kind of angling the sanding block. So it goes right down that. So 
seems to work pretty good. see if the uh, tent is still there. Oh. Tent is still in place, I guess. Yep. We've had them fly away before. You can kind of see how you want to get going. This actually goes. Reasonably fast. It makes a big difference in the finished product. Uh, yes, yes. Taking huge. extra time in preparing the stock well makes a huge, huge difference. Like, uh, you know, I've seen some people that get in a little bit of a hurry with the finishing and there's still tool marks left. And it shows you might not, might be, it might be difficult to see them in the wood, but when you start finishing a gun, tool marks will jump out at you. So, best to, to take your time, get good lighting, make sure there's no tool marks left. By tool marks, I mean machine marks from when we machine the stocks. See a little stock was a tiny bit high along the butt plate there, and I still think it's a little bit high, if you can see. And you can see, so I'm gonna go to the sanding block. Hopefully it'll cut down a little better. Like the ramp on the cheek piece, this has a pretty minimal ramp, but you can just kind of let the paper roll up it. And another way to do alongside the locks is to take a piece of sandpaper along the lock and side plate panels and take a piece of sandpaper and fold it over once, maybe twice. And you can kind of let it curve to the, the shape of the stock. And I'm still going with the grain. with the wrist. So you get the idea, I think. So it's looking pretty good. So since it's relatively big, I'm gonna use this sanding block. We've done about from the back of the barrel back. Oh, we gotta use the toe. Now when you sand over an area like the guard inlet, since there's not much wood there, if you use the same amount of time or force, you're gonna wallow this out. So be a little more gentle there. Again, look for any kind of pull marks. I will continue up the four stock. You know, I'll do one side of the four stock and then call it quits after that for this grit on the camera anyway. And then 
we'll start using finer grit paper. So, I'm gonna move these pins over. You can kind of pull them to one side if you want, or you could pull them out. It's just all optional. I'm gonna pull this out. The ramrod pipe I'm gonna take out. When you take your ramrod pipes out, it's a good idea to keep them in the same orientation as you put them in. They might not fit the same. I'm gonna pull this one out too. Come on, baby. There we go. Now we should be able to Another place that we need to flush off is the wood and the nose cap, although it's very close, but that's another area we'll need. As I mentioned, we're gonna sand the four stocks, so. I have this prop that I use as well. It's a handy thing. It's, so you can see what it is. It just adjusts up and down. Piece of metal down there. The fact that it's small in diameter, but heavy is a good thing. You can get close to it, you're tripping over it, but it's still stable enough to keep it upright. Did you make that? We did. There's just a piece of pipe, nut welded on, a little bolt, and then a piece of wood, a piece of leather. This is something we may try to sell as well, but I was having a little trouble finding all the right stuff to make it cheap enough. The base is kind of heavy and a little bit expensive. Okay, so let's keep on going. We'll do the four stock of this side, then we'll move on to something else. Now move a little faster here. Again, I'm just kind of riding up this ramp. It's still going parallel to the the barrel in this case. So I just kind of ride up. And also kind of, let me go like this, see here, like this. And again, this all can be done with scrapers too, but they're usually a little more difficult to control. So we're just gonna do sanding first. And I'll probably show some examples of scraping. These magnifiers I'm wearing, uh, I use it wear a lot. Anybody that's seen my other videos probably seen me in them. Uh, so my vision up, up close isn't what it used to be. I used to have a very good vision up close, but over time it's faded, like most, happens with most people. And these happen to be, so I, I use Optivisors a lot, Optivisor brand. These happen to be some uh, imported varieties that we found for a little cheaper price. And I've been trying those out for the last couple weeks and they work pretty well. They're uh, they're pretty darn good. Maybe not quite as good as the Optivisor, but it, the, the difference is very marginal. I've been happy with them. Okay. Now to get up right up against the barrel, we're gonna take the barrel out. But we can do a lot while the barrel's in. and We'll just keep the stock a little stiffer and less chance of it breaking. Okay, so now we have this four stock area up here to do. Maybe we can use 
bigger, see if we can use this bigger sanding block to speed it up a little bit. Again, I'm moving the light to make it look as bad as I can. So I mentioned the, the vacuum pump catching on fire. Maybe you're wondering why we have a vacuum pump. So we're you know, more or less a machine shop here and vacuum is sometimes used for work holding. You can hold pieces in place for various work holding operations when you're machining the parts. So that's why we have a vacuum pump. I think you get the idea here of what we're doing. We'll do the whole stock with 150 grit, and then we'll go over it with 220 grit. And what the good news is, after you've gone through the 150 grit, subsequent grits take a lot less time. But the procedure is very much the same. After we do 220, we'll go to 320, and then we'll wet the stock down. Well, that is called is called raising the grain. So what stock down is water. I've heard of people use alcohol. Not as good of idea because you want it to have maximum effect. Alcohol raises the grain less that it's gonna raise later usually. So use water. And then after the grain raises, after the grain raises, you sand the sand it again with 320. Do that a couple times at least, two, three times, and the stock is ready to be stained then. In this case, we want to be flush right up against the muzzle cap too. Our tent is on the verge of flying away. Put the sand and the wood and the brass together. At least on the edge. You know. Okay. Okay, so now we can't get up near the top of the barrel because the barrel's in place. So we're gonna pull the barrel out and do the rest of the same. Let's pull our pins. stock a little easier I think. Go ahead and put it like this. Kind of hard to see probably with the camera but I guess you understand what I'm trying to accomplish here. Right against the barrel you can't really sand with the barrel in place very well so and I'm again carefully working up along those lock panels. Making sure the top has a nice little radius on it. You don't want any kind of a flat or anything on the top of the barrel channel edges. 
again, we're gonna change the angle of this a little bit. It's light. Boy, the light the power keeps flickering. So it's probably good that we chose to do a video now because when power flickers a lot, it messes up CNC equipment. So it's a good time to do a video. Hopefully the wind calms down here. That looks pretty good. like this you could also if you wanted you can fold over a piece of sandpaper and work it like that big open areas that aren't going to cause any problem you usually want to sandpaper back but sometimes it's not a problem to fold it over a time or two why do you want it back to usually well if it, it, it's less prone to creating swales or inconsistent surfaces when it's back it's more prone to more carefully making, following the original surface because um, your fingers put uneven pressure on it. But if you're careful how you use it and you fold it over a time or two, it can be useful. I don't think it's as useful when you're sanding the, the, the stock, at least with 150 grit. You know, when you go to finer grits, you can fold it over a few times and work the stock down because you're not taking near as much off. We have a little bit to do up here and I think then we're we're done. Again, I'm standing right over the nose cap. Making sure there are no inconsistencies. There we go. Pretty nice. Okay, so what's next is I'll finish up this 150 grit on the other side of the four stock, and then we'll start with the 220 grit. So the 220 grit will be, like I said, very much like what we're doing with the 150 grit. Uh, we may use the paper a little more, not back, maybe fold it over one or two times you can get away with it and maybe just a little quicker and easier that way uh, and then we'll go to 320 grit same as the 220 grit some people like to stop at 220 grit but i think it's better to go to 320 and then we'll raise the grain so i'll probably come back to the video here and show you some of the 220 and 320 process although we won't cover it as, as in detail show a little bit of that and then we'll after that we'll skip ahead to the grain raising Okay, so the stock has been sanded completely to 150 grit. Now we'll go to the 220 grit. Peel off the 150 grit. Pull a piece of 220 grit out. We'll basically just repeat the same process we did with the that's the surface you don't want to get crazy sanding on just a little bit fine like i said we'll just do the same thing we did with the 150 grit and it goes much faster
a little care and make sure you get all the previous sanding marks out and the previous grit. Okay, that's pretty good. And as I mentioned, I'll show you a little bit about folding the sandpaper over and using it that way. You can take a piece of paper and fold it over, and for lighter sanding work, you can get away with like this. You still have to respect the shape. You definitely don't want it to go zip up over the lock panel. Really bad. Now, incidentally, I didn't mention this is the process you want to go through, even if you're going to carve the rifle. So you prep the stock and then carve it after it's prepped. That's pretty good. I'd say that's pretty good for the uh, 220 on this side. Okay, I'll go ahead and finish the rest of the stock with the, the 220, and then we'll come back and I'll show you a little bit with the 320. Okay, I'm back. We're gonna do the 320. Gonna hit the lock panel with it. A little bit right here. Now, in this case, the 320, I think I'm just gonna fold it over the piece of paper and do it like that. I think I can get pretty good with that. So another power outage. How about that? It might come back on. Yep. started raining. Okay. You can even roll a piece of paper up sometimes if you bend it like that, you can get into these grooves, but you don't want to go straight down the groove. Even in there, you want it to kind of roll across the groove at an angle. If you go straight down the groove, well, you'll make other grooves. Yeah. 
if it's a little flimsy, you can bend this over double if you want. It'll give you a little more control. It'll be a little stiffer. Pretty good. So after this, I do the whole stock in 320, and then we'll raise the grain. Okay, so I've gone over the whole stock. I'll sit with 320 again after the second grain raising, and finish is pretty darn nice and then I also just buffed it down with a little scotch bright after that just a little red scotch bright just kind of buffed it down like you're seeing here and you can see the finish is super super nice now like I mentioned before if you are going to do carving you want to prep the stock the same whether you would be carving or not ideally there's always once you get more experience there's ways to kind of there's exceptions and ways to avoid things but it's best to prep the stock first and then begin carving after it's all prepped what about the hardware is that after carving or yeah so carving? now so the hardware I, I usually don't you could polish hardware up now anytime after the stock is all sanded um, but I'd probably, if I was going to carve it, I'd wait. I'd carve the gun first, and then I'd probably polish up the hardware at the end. You know, sometimes I even stain the gun and finish it, and the hardware hasn't been polished up. So, not a problem there at all. Gone through the progression of 150 grit, 220 grit, and 320 grit on the whole stock. So, the next step is to raise the grain. And the idea of raising the grain is to wet the wood down. And what that does is it expands any wood fibers that have been compressed uh, and cause them to raise back up to their, their unstressed state. And the reason that is good is because if you don't do it, as the gun ages, those fibers will slowly come back to their unstressed state and you'll have a rough stock. So you, you want to raise the grain. It's a good idea to do at least once, a couple times or three times is probably better. In order to do that, all you need to do is take a paper towel, a paper towel here that's pretty well saturated with water, kind of dripping, and we'll just wet the stock down. Very, very simple. I'm just going to hold on to it. It's always kind of neat too because you can see the figure as you're doing this. You know, it'll show off the what, this, what the curl looks like. So that's a ni very nice piece of wood there, as you can see. We're just going to wet it down make sure it's kind of well saturated too don't worry about you want enough water you don't have to flood it but you want enough that's for sure do you worry about inlets no you don't don't get it try if it gets in the inlets it's fine but you don't really want to get in the inlets you just want it to be on the areas that show but if it gets in there that's fine too it could in theory swell the inlets a little bit but Unlikely. Let's get all the different areas, which looks like we're doing pretty good here. Uh, I think that look for any dry spots that we didn't get. I think we've got it pretty pretty well.
So you can see the nice figure in the stock showing. Pretty nice piece of wood here. I figure we're talking about the curl. And if you think of uh, a piece of wood as being like a bundle of straws held together, curl just means where those straws are wavy, sort of like wavy hair. And then when you cut through those waves and direction, it changes, uh, you, know, you have more end grain in some areas and more straight grain. So it's not about like, hard stripes and soft stripes. It has nothing to do with that. You hear people talking about that. It's nothing to do with, it's all the same wood. It's just wavy. So now at this stage, you can just let it dry if you want, or you can uh, speed it up a little bit with a hair dryer would work. A hot, a heat gun works as well. Um, and I've heard some people say they think that it causes the wood to raise the grain a little bit better when you heated up with a hot air source. I'm not sure about that, but just to speed things along, I usually use a heat gun. And you can just just kind of move the heat gun around and you can see it's drying. Drying the wood. You can put it out in the sun too, I've done that. But even doing nothing is fine. Just letting it dry. Now depending on how much, depending on the type of wood, how hard it is, what kind of trauma the wood received while it was being shaped, will depend on how much grain raising there is. So this is a piece of red maple. Um, not the hardest of wood, but pretty hard. As far as red maple goes, this is a good piece of red maple. And when it was shaped, it was shaped with sharp tools. So we, of course, shape on machines that use rotating tools and slice the wood pretty well. So I can see that there's not a lot of grain that's being raised on this because there's not a lot of compression or trauma that the wood received. Now, in comparison, a gun that was shaped with a rasp by hand there's a lot more compression and uh, you know, you'll see more grain raising in those cases. So the straws are hollow in the wood, wood structure and if they're distorted, then when you put the water on, it'll swell them back to their original shape. That's what, what I mean by that. So we'll just keep on heating the rest of it.
Okay, that's not 100%. It's pretty darn, darn close to being dry. I'll probably just let it sit for a minute or two. Maybe dry out a little further. Let's take a look here. A little more profile in the, in the surface. A little more fuzziness. You can feel it when you're on your fingers across it too. So this grain didn't raise heavily, pretty lightly. But going through this process will, will be very good for the, the stock and the, the finish that you'll receive in the end. So I'm just gonna wait for this to dry. Just set it here and come back to it maybe, I don't know, five or 10 minutes just to, just to make sure it's fully dry. And then we'll take 320 grit sandpaper. We'll use a fresh piece, a very sharp piece. So you don't wanna use used paper because that can just smash those fibers back down. You wanna just slice them off very lightly. And uh, we'll probably do it a second time, although with this stock, there's a good chance it wouldn't be necessary but probably to do it the second time just, just because we can. Okay, so we waited five or 10 minutes just to make sure the stock is good and dry. I'm gonna take a piece of 320 grit sandpaper. In, in this case, I'm just gonna fold it over. There's no need to back it with anything. And we're gonna go through the same process of, of sanding it. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to clamp it in the vise, but I'm going to hit this area with it out of the vise, because if I clamp it in the vise, it'll just smash it back down. So I'm just going to hit it first. You're going very light? Yeah, pretty light, just to shear off those raised fibers. You don't want to, like, cut down and expose more new wood that might be compressed. So just, just take off the, the raised fibers, and you can feel it, too, whether it's smooth or not know how well you've done. So I'm gonna put this in the vise, but now if I squeeze it, it won't smash the wood down. So, same process as before. Come in here and start sanding. 320 grit. Just knock off these Sand it just enough that the, the bit that's raised up is, is sheared off, smoothed off. Like I said, you can tell by the way you touch it. The dust off, you can see. Yeah. Compare it, you can see the Make sure we keep using a sharp piece of paper too, because this gets a little dull. We'll, Flip over to the other side. And again, respect the shape of the stock. Don't just go over the corners, work up the corners. Sand with the grain. You can also use a piece of scotch right for this, although I don't think it quite does as good of a job where the raised bits of fibers that stick up are kind of, I think they're grabbed a little more, maybe torn and pulled out. It's, it's a small difference, but you can see the difference. Not saying I've used, not used scotch right for this, but I think this, the, the sandpaper does a little better job. An added benefit of doing it a couple times is if you miss an area the first, you're likely to hit it on the second. See how it goes, these finer grits go a lot faster. 
Looks this side's pretty much done here. We'll go ahead and use a little, little backing on this side panel since it is flat. And we'll start rolling around now. Get some on the top maybe and roll over to the other side. Again, I'm just going right over the butt plate. And that'll be polished after the stock is complete. If your butt plate was already all polished up, it'd be all scratched up and messed up between the building process and the, and the sanding process, it'd be all messed up. You'd have to go polish it again. this side it's really just more of the same I may get another piece of sandpaper here in a minute because I don't think it's quite as sharp as it was that light you can, that was to allow me to be able to see this corner a little better before it was all kind of lit up but with, by casting a shadow I can see this corner a little better and I can then avoid rounding it over when I sand so that's an example of why you want to move your light let me go ahead and hit this with the whoops over that 320 there we go and then this process is just, just repeated. Over the whole stock, we'll sand the whole stock, and then we'll come wet it down again. Now, with this gun here, the way this wood raised up, I think two grain raisings would be plenty. Because it really didn't fuzz up that much. This area. It's the same grit for both grain raisings. Yeah, 320 is a pretty good, pretty good grit. It needs to be sharp. So it's coming along well. So I think what I'll do is I'll finish the rest of this off camera. And there's probably no need to show you the grain raising process again the second time. We'll just show you it when it's completed at the end. 
Okay, so I've gone over the whole stock. I'll sit with 320 again after the second grain raising. And the finish is pretty darn nice. And then I also just buffed it down with a little Scotch Brite. After that, just a little red Scotch Brite. Just kind of buffed it down like you're seeing here. And you can see the finish is super, super nice. So this is ready for staining if you don't want to do any carving on the stock. Ready to be stained. Now, we'll probably do a little carving on this, so we'll not stain it right away. Now, like I mentioned before, if you are gonna do carving, you wanna prep the stock the same whether you would be carving or not, ideally. There's always, once you get more experience, there's ways to kind of, there's exceptions and ways to avoid things, but it's best to prep the stock first and then begin carving after it's all prepped. What about the hardware? Is that after carving or before Yeah, so, carving? Now, so the hardware, I, I usually don't, you could polish hardware up now, anytime after the stock is all sanded. Um, but I'd probably, if I was gonna carve it, I'd wait, I'd carve the gun first. And then I'd probably polish up the hardware at the end. Um, you know, sometimes I even stain the gun and finish it and the hardware hasn't been polished up. So, not a problem there at all. So on another stock, maybe a scrap stock, I'll demonstrate uh, some techniques and, on scraping a stock. You can kind of compare and see the difference. step in prepping the scraper is to make sure the edges are flat and square and sharp. Are these diamond stones? Yeah, these are diamond stones and they work well because they don't groove. An ordinary stone something will tend to groove more because the scraper is so thin. These will cut better with um, with some water on there, but I'm just being lazy here. And that's prepped up pretty well. We'll use a small one here and do the same thing with it. Sharp. It'll actually probably scrape wood right now, but to scrape better, you can make a hook on the edge of the, the scraper. And that's the traditional way to, to sharpen a cabinet scraper. You can look online and see lots of different ways to accomplish this. I'll just uh, show you how I do it. Take a hard rod. This is a commercially available burnisher for a scraper just a hardened steel rod is all it is you get away with a drill bit shank if you polish it up and work even better just 
sure I get the edge that I was supposed to here. I think that's the edge that I prepped. And then clamp it in a vise. Ideally, a vise that you know is a little longer would be better. This one isn't grabbing it too well, but we'll try it anyway. And we want to angle the burnisher slightly and kind of push at the same time while it's being angled. Like I said, this vise is a little small, but we'll try it. trying to do is we're trying to actually deform the, the metal and make a little hook out of it. As you do this, you should be able to feel a burr begin to form, which you can. It's very small. The more you burnish, the, the, the bigger the hook will be. And the bigger the hook, we'll maybe make a little coarser scrape, scrape finish. And maybe the smaller the burr, probably a little finer. The coarser finish, will, the cor larger burr will probably scrape faster, more aggressively. So we'll just try to make maybe a medium burr is what we'll do. And I'm just angling this burnisher just a little bit. Okay, probably enough. I can feel a pretty good burr. Now what I'm gonna do is, this is not everybody does this step, but I find it to help out is to straighten this burr out and then push it back down. And by straightening it, we'll just hold it along the edge of the bench and we'll, we'll drag this burr back up. So now there's no burr, the burr's standing up. So we're gonna roll that burr back over just with a few strokes. will cut significantly better. You can also resharpen it that way. Rather than going through the whole process, roll the burr up and then push it back down and you can resharpen probably four or five times that way without going through the whole step. So I don't know if that burr probably is invisible. It's very small, but it's definitely there. You can feel it. Now with this curved scraper, we'll do the same thing. Clamp it or it's a nickel. Wanna to go to that one? This is a kind of an interesting vise. This is a Gressel vise. They're European style, so it's a dovetail vise. So see the dovetails here. And the rear jaw moves rather than the front jaw. So it's a real good vise. It had, came with slightly serrated jaws, but I ground almost all the serrations away. Okay, so I got it a little bit of a hook there. And this one, I guess I'll have to be a little careful. We don't want to squeeze the burr we've already created, or you'll flatten it over. With the leather, it should be okay. I'll just try to. So you only need to do one half of it then? Yeah, you can do both sides if you want, but you know, one is enough to... Okay. Do the job. So I didn't do as great of a job right there, but I have a little trouble holding it. Get a little bit of a bird to form. Okay, that'll be good enough. And this one I too could roll the burr up and roll it back down, but we'll just go with it right now. So I'm gonna actually put a little mark on so I can remember which side of the shark. 
side. This side and this side, I'm pretty sure. Yep. And this side. And I think I mentioned previously that uh, you can make these out of saw blades. You can buy commercial scrapers and cut them down. Any steel that's probably in the range of spring hardness, 40, 45 Rockwell C, make a fine scraper. Okay, so here's a stock that's been uh, been uh, scrapped for some reason. Now, it's, it's best to have good support when you're scraping. This is kind of marginal, so I'd ideally want to loosen this up, tilt, turn the vise a little bit, which is probably what I'll do. Okay, so I have the sharpened edge. And again, I'm gonna work the light so I can see what I'm doing. To use a card scraper, hold it your fingers like this, bend it slightly. And I would, if I was doing this for real, I'd have the butt plate installed. That way, because the tendency is gonna be to round this corner over, which you don't wanna do. And you can scrape right over the brass. It may dull the scraper a little faster, but it's not a huge deal. So just pretend like the butt plate's installed here. But you'll be able to kind of see the, you know, making a nice little curl. And it leaves a beautiful finish and is very fast. Which again, you have to respect all the shape like we talked about before. You can bend it and get in areas a little bit, especially with these thinner ones. This one's cutting excellent. You really want a scraper to make curls rather than dust. The harder you push, it can be more aggressive. The lighter touch you use will result in a, a more finely scraped finish. Getting up in the, the comb area can be a little tricky. So we'll get up in there a ways with this. Now you want to also respect the grain direction when you're scraping. When you're going in the proper direction, it'll make a kind of a, a nice uh, shiny cut. When you start to buck the grain or go opposite the grain, it'll be more whitish. It'll make a different sound too when you're scraping. So we're gonna just come down here and see these nice curls coming off. If you want a little coarser rifle, you can do this a little more aggressively. It'll leave more facets. It'll follow the grain a little bit, too. So if there's curl, you may end up with a little ripply surface, depending on how the curl is. This scraper is scraping very nice. So the nice thing about this is when you're done with this, it's a pretty darn good finish. Raise the grain a time or two and scrape again, and you're good to go. You could even if you wanted to, if you wanted a more coarsely finished gun, you could scrape and then and then stain right after it too, especially if you employ some burnishing. See how nice of a finish that's. Let's see if we can see those facets too. Now those facets, if done carefully, can add a lot of interest to a gun. If done sloppily, they don't add a lot of interest. So again, I'm gonna start working up to the lock panels. Keep moving your lights so you can actually see what you're doing. That's pretty good in that area. I like that we're leaving this a little coarser takes a little more skill to leave it coarsely and look good, to be honest, because you can go over it lightly and get everything just right. And, but to have these nice, nice coarse facets that kind of look good makes a little, a little more work. 
So you have to respect the grain direction like I mentioned. Now, if I want to do the top of the wrist, this would be bucking the grain if I go from here to here because generally the grain comes somewhat out the top of the wrist, depending on the orientation of the stock. It would be rare to have the grain otherwise. So in this case, you do the top of the wrist, let's start up here and go run down the wrist. You can see some of our machining marks there. Those should just scrape out very, very nice. And I'm trying to see what I'm doing rather than just going by guessing. Guessing doesn't get you much anywhere. Change the light so I can see what I'm doing. And again, I'm just being careful to work up to that lock panel, but not over it. I'm trying to set the light so I can see that edge of that lock panel. Okay, we're doing well. We're getting some nice scraper facets there. I do like those. pretty good. Now, we didn't get in the, the comb area very well. We got in there somewhat, if you remember, we were coming in like this. And I'll try to do a little bit more. It's grabbing a little bit. You can see here how it's wanting to grab a bit. So I'm going like this, it's kind of grabbing. So we can try a different shape scraper here. Let's see if we can get in here a little better. And I didn't sharpen this real well, but hopefully it'll be good enough. So we're going to get the right angle here let's try this one first the shallow angle so i'm going to hold it a bit of a skew and try to run it this direction working well Okay, so I think we've done a pretty good job here. Take a look at the camera. So we've gotten into that comb pretty darn good. So, just repeat the process all over the guy. And he's, then you have a, yourself a straight, straight finish. On the patch box here, we do the same thing. A little bit of fuzz to keep it from cutting, so. I'm just brushing that cut. Oops, wrong side too. There's a good side. No wonder it wasn't cutting with the nickel. So it's doing well. We'll do a little bit on the other side. I think scraping is a little bit more, it's a little more skill than sanding. But it's very nice to do. Nice curls. Come on. So the butt plate was on here. I wouldn't have a problem with this edge. Just wanting to fall over that edge and catch. It's going well. So we're, we're bucking the grain a little bit when you hear that little, little louder noise. Probably when I was running up the cheek piece. So if I come down the cheek piece, it's a little better direction. The ramp that leads up to the cheek piece. Okay. With this being flexible, you can bend it. Come on. Grabbing a little bit on me. See that little line there? It grabbed. That's not a good scraper mark. There's good scraper marks and bad scraper marks. That wouldn't be a good one. 
Maybe move it up in the vise a little bit and just get a little more control of the stock. It doesn't move on me. Putting my belly against it here too. Hold it a little more stable. Just grabbing, just grabbing a little bit. Let me try to get more bend out of it. Instead of being skewed, go a little straighter. There, it's calming down a little bit. So the skew can help you get in areas, but it can be a little bit more difficult to control. A nice thin scraper like this, you can bend. That's working out very well. Now we would move with this little guy again in the in the comb area. We'll figure out the best angle for it. That's going good. Move the light to see how we're doing. Change the light and it'll show what's going on. You can cast a shadow. Very nice. Okay. So I think you get the idea of scraping. So if this starts to get a little dull, you can just roll the burr back up, up straight. Probably the edge of the bench would be a little bit better. Come around here, Catherine, you can, on the edge of the bench. Roll that burr up right again, and then push it back. And then it'll be really sharp again. You can do this four or five times before you need an actual actual full proper sharpening. And underneath the cheek piece you can just run it down like this. Nice shaving there. Very nice. As mentioned, this will leave a little bit coarser finish or a little bit less refined finish than sanding, but it can often look very nice and very appropriate for a long rifle. Now, some long, long rifles were finished very, very finely without scraper marks. They're probably sanded originally. If you think of some of the later, especially the guns, you know, early 19th century guns, very late 18th century guns that were, that were finely made. Think about maybe some of the guns like John Armstrong would come to mind. Very carefully made, very carefully finished. When was sandpaper invented? So sandpaper, I don't know exactly. All I know is that it's been around for a long time. In the colonial period, there was sandpaper. How readily available, I'm not quite sure. Um, but it wasn't the same quality that we have for certain. I know the guys at Williamsburg, you know, you know, they have more information on the subject. I think Gary Brumfield's old website talks about sandpaper, I believe, so you can check that out. Flint Rifle Smith, Gary Brumfield has since passed away, but his website is still up. He passed away maybe 10 years ago or more, but he was a gunsmith at Colonial Williamsburg, a master gunsmith at Colonial Williamsburg. down the wrist. So I think you get the idea. So that's about it for prepping the stock for staining. We'll probably do a little bit of carving on this rifle that we're working on, although we may not, I'm not sure. So we may do some carving on it before we stain it. So probably next week there'll be another video.
<laughs> He's actually more of a dog than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> having a great time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 that was neat. Is it a him or a her? It's a him. He tossed some down. He did. That's big. Yeah, he's. <laughs> Are you a tired girl? Yes. Was that fun? I'm tired too. Are you tired too? Was that fun, girly? Yes. Yes. Murphy. Hey buddy. Look at you too. Look at you too.